Okay. We're live. Hello, welcome back. I'm gonna be running through practice tests. Hey stream. Hope you guys are having a good evening. Everything's happening here. They can barely hear you. Look at the video capture device. It's, a, it's amazing. What's up, guys? Good evening! Dude, you just blew so, out my fucking mic. Good evening. How is everyone doing? Today is a beautiful day. Okay, dude. Hi, my name is Russell. Can I move to an rogue weapon? The term Evil Twin refers to a rogue wireless access point. Set up for eavesdropping for stealing sensitive user data. Evil Twin replaces a legitimate access point, and by advertising its own presence with the same SSID, appears as a legitimate access point to connecting hosts. Gaining unauthorized access to a Bluetooth device is referred to as blue snarfing. Hmm. Because it's access. Blue jacking is just messaging. I'm gonna go blue snarfing. Practice of okay, this is blue jacking. A wireless dissociation attack is a type of select two answers. Cryptographic attack, downgrade attack. Deauthentication attack, brute force attack, denial of service attack. The answer is. Why'd your voice get so low? The chat rate. I'm not saying anything. Dude, you're on stream. Thank you for what? I guess I guess you're out of the closet. I mean, in back in the closet. What do you mean? I'm 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 exposed. Okay. A wireless jamming attack is a type of cryptographic attack, denial of service attack, brute force attack, or downgrade attack. The answer is denial of service. RFID or radio frequency identification is vulnerable to A. Spoofing, B. Eavesdropping, C. Data inter interception, D. Replay attacks, E. DOS. F, all the above. Wait, don't you say anything? I mean, I probably got into it. It's definitely all the above. What? It's asking. Can... It's asking which one of these are is RFID vulnerable to. Oh, you can do a replay attack. Yeah, you just take take the radio frequency. Wait till the person leaves. Like, let's say they they lock their their vault with like a radio frequency. At, uh, lock, and like you like put up a key card to get in. Uh, you just clone that key card and you replay that attack by going at a later time. What about how could you die interception? Or I mean, you can just like block it. I can think data interception. That's just like yeah. I guess it would be like a DOS. I don't know. The way I thought of data interception at first is. Um, yeah, just listening. That's what. That's how I thought of it at first. I don't know. I'm gonna go with all of the above. Near field communication is vulnerable to. Which of the following statements can be used to describe the character characteristics of an on-path attack? Select all that apply. In an on-path attack, attackers do not have access to packets exchanged during the communication between the two devices. That's not true. An on-path attack is also known as a man-in-the-middle attack. That's true. In an on-path attack, attackers place themselves on the communication route between two devices. That is also true. In an on-path attack, attackers intercept or modify packets sent between two communicating devices. You could also do that, yeah. An on-path attack attackers generate forged packets and inject them into the network. You can also do that. So 
until then? No, but whoever watches this later, here's your server. And I know this is untraditional, usually the client's on the left side, but here's your client, right? And he wants to access his bank account. But, there's another guy, and he's evil. That's you. I drew the laptop the wrong way. It's supposed to look like this. This would be the desk. Anyways, there's a man in the middle. It's literally a man in the middle of this communication. From the client to the server. He's stealing the data. And so that's why all of those would apply. Or not all of them. The attacker managed to associate his slash her MAC address with the IP address of the default gateway. In result, the targeted host is sending network traffic to the attacker's IP address instead of the IP address of the default gateway. Based on the given info, what type of attack is taking place in this scenario? So he associated the attacker associated his MAC, or her MAC address with the IP address of the default gateway. So he's acting as the default gateway. Um, so that means every host that has that default gateway set as the default gateway will continue to send it to that IP. So let's say 1.1.1.1. But the attacker changed the the table to show that his MAC address is associated with 1.1.1.1. Um, and so a targeted host is sending network traffic to the attacker's IP address instead of the IP address of the default gateway. Based on the given info, which type of attack is taking place? That would be an art poisoning. Uh, DNS poisoning is similar, but that's not the case, I don't think. Media access control or MAC flooding is a network attack that compromises the security of a network by overflowing its memory to store the MAC address table. I'd say true. An attack that relies on altering the burned in address of a NIC to assume or network interface card to assume the identity of a different network host is known as Mac spoofing and Mac cloning. Which of the following falls into the category of layer 2 attacks? So the way I remember, you know, layer 2 um, is anything that doesn't really have an IP. Um, now that's not to say that like ports are layer 2 because they're layer 4. Transport. Transport. Um, but the way that I remember layer 2 attacks is by recognizing that it's not one layer 1 physical. And it's not layer three, uh, the networking uh, layer. So layer two attacks would be MAC addresses. Uh, that's how I remember it. So any anything to do with MAC would be layer two attack attacks. The term domain hijacking refers to a situation in which domain registrants, due to unlawful actions of third parties, lose control over their domain names. refers to a situation in which domain registrants, due to unlawful actions of third parties, lose control over their domain names. I don't know if that's true. The way I was taught domain hijacking is when a company forgets to renew their um, their their domain name, so their right to own that domain name, and then another company just takes that out of nowhere and then turns it into whatever they want. So it's not always like illegal. Like it could just be the company forgot to renew their domain. Uh, I'm gonna put this one in chat GPT and see what it thinks.
Okay, so it is true. Remapping a domain name to a rogue IP address is an example of what kind of exploit? That's a DNS poisoning. So this is quite literally the same thing as uh, our poisoning uh, or max spoofing because you're 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 assigning you're assigning an IP to a device that's not actually supposed to have that IP, um, and those attacks do the same thing as a DNS poisoning which just assigns uh, an IP address to like a rogue domain. Uh, and, and, and an instance of that, like, let's say you were to, let's say you were to search up Google, google.com, but you forget to put the E. Uh, no, 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 that's not what a domain poisoning is. So th these attacks are normally done in the host table and I can actually show you the host table. Turn our, your C drive, traditionally Windows. Um, System 32, I believe. drivers etc and here's the table i personally have not modified mine um but you can see that oh, i'll just i'll just make this bigger so this is a host table right and it comes like this by default um and the, they put this is a sample host file used by microsoft tcp ip for windows this file contains the mappings of IP addresses to host names. Each entry should be kept on an individual line. The IP address should be placed in the first column, followed by the corresponding host name. The IP address and the host name should be separated by at least one space. Additionally, comments such as these may be inserted on individual lines or following the machine denoted by a hash symbol. So, for example, uh, let's say you want to DNS poison one specific laptop and you you connect so you have I need to paint this out oh, that is not what I wanted to do okay so this is your network right you got your server it's your DNS server and this is what connects to the internet Right? And then, normally this would connect to like a switch before going to these clients, but for simplicity, I'm gonna leave it as such. You know what, I can't leave it as such because that won't work for this example. So this is your switch right here. Right, and these clients are all connecting to the switch. When they connect, and they're they're sending a DNS query, so they're requesting to go to the internet through their DNS because their uh, their DNS is in within their IP settings. So here, let me. I'll show you this really quick. Hopefully this, uh, here we go. This is a blank page. So this, this might be hard to see on the stream because it's quite small, but right here you'll see use the following DNS server address. So within your network archite uh, architecture or your network layout, you'll have a preferred DNS server. So you'll go through your own network, network's DNS to reach out to the internet. And let's say somebody takes over uh, the DNS, or not the DNS, your your computer. Let's say somebody's like sitting on the switch. Like, you got this bad guy right here. 
and he's sitting on the switch. He's got a laptop. He gets access to your device, but you don't want, he doesn't want you to know that he has access. And so he pushes out his domain's IP address, 1.1.3.69. So instead of you going through his, and instead of you going through your regular DNS, he'll change your DNS himself. Um, and he can do this through the host table, um, which I don't know if it's referred to as host table hijacking, but that's what it is. And instead of your information going this way, the correct way, let me draw that in green. He now hijacked it to go through him and to go to his internet. So he's harvesting your information because you think that you're communicating through your secured DNS server into the nice internet, the one that where all your stuff is encrypted through whatever. And so yeah, that's that's what you would do. Like, and you would change, you know, this IP. So you leave this IP, right? Let's say this is your DNS and it's set in your host table. You would change the name of it to like maliciouswebsite.com, whatever the attacker's website is. Um, and that's how the host table hijacking works. Oh shit, I didn't have my Ethernet cable plugged in. I was like, why am I on this, this network? Let's see, is it still working? Uh, it took a while to explain. URL redirection is a characteristic feature of I want to say like typo squatting which is just like, that was actually what I was about to show you guys before I got distracted. Type of squatting, you go to your URL bar and you type google.com on accident. I think that's a URL redirection. Like you, you went to a URL you didn't mean to go to. So we're gonna roll with that and see if we get it right. Uh, which of the following enables client-side URL redirection? Which of the following enables client-side URL redirection? I want to say hosts. But I also want to say local host. I don't know. I'm going to go with hosts. Which of the following factors has the biggest impact on domain reputation? One, domain age. Two, missing SSL certificate. Three, derivative content. Four, bounce rate. Five, distribution and spam. Which of the following has the biggest impact? I'd say missing is to sell a certificate. Because while all of these are like important and you would want to advertise your domain being out there for, for so long or, or, or your distribution of spam is like very minimal, 
or, or very, very, maybe very maximum. Um, I still think the SSL certificate's the best option there. As opposed to the simple denial of service attacks that are usually performed from a single system, a distributed denial of service attack uses multiple compromised computers to perform the attack against its target. The intermediary systems that are used as platform for the attack are the secondary victims of the DOS attack. They are often referred to as zombies and collectively as a bot, bot, botnet. That's true, because the computers used in that attack are also technically victims if they didn't want to do that attack. Which of the which is what is the most common form of a DDoS attack? Say application based. Which type of DDoS attack targets industrial equipment and infrastructure? Is a indicator of compromise, Internet of Things, uh, MIT's attack. Uh, it's like if you were to to assess your own vulnerabilities, you would use MITRE attack guidelines, um, and then OT is operational technology. I don't think. I mean, I guess if if you call it an OT DDoS attack, that'd be different, but it just says OT, which is kind of weird. Okay, I'm gonna roll through these really quickly. Uh, I'm not gonna really stop, because I think I explained these pretty well. You can pause it and check out the correct answer along with the question if you need. Did you get the first few questions correct? Yeah, like all of them. Except for this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in an on-path attack, attackers do not generate forced packets and inject them in the network. What? I feel like they could though. They could. I guess they have the ability but, yeah. to. An art poisoning is a layer two attack. reason I didn't put that because address resolution protocol has to do with uh, IPs ah this one was farming I was see I was in between these two because directory traversal and on path doesn't really make sense for this question um, I know you guys saw me on the fence about that a little bit. I hate being wrong. Distribution of spam has the biggest impact on domain reputation. Network based DDoS attacks are the most common forms. Okay. Well, it says I got 75% success ratio and the percentage secured is 85.19 so still technically passed because you need an 83.3333333 on the CompTIA security plus so that was the network attacks quiz um, I'm gonna go so the next video later tonight is gonna be the penetration testing quiz which is only 12 questions and probably do another one too I mean and then I might keep going through these ones again even though I've already done that in previous videos I think it would be good to go over these again um, I plan on taking my test sometime next week so yeah it's good stuff thanks for tuning in uh, if you want to catch me live and ask questions and interact, which I've had many people do so far. Not many. I've had a few people do that. Um, set notifications.
to get notified when I'm streaming and we can go through some of these things. You can ask whatever questions you want. Uh, yeah. See you guys in the next one.